Okay. Hello, good morning and uh, good evening, all my friends in the webinar of the Chang'e Memorial Hospital Cranial Facial Webinar. We are so happy to have our friend, Dr. Kishou from Nepal to share his previous uh, experience uh, working and uh, learning in our institute, the Chang'e Memorial Hospital Cranial Facial Team. Dr. Kishou has spent uh, one year uh, with us when in the 2020. At that time, we have several uh, fellow as well, and we working uh, together uh, even in the beginning of the pandemic time. Uh, I think the Kishou will share a lot of very valuable experience, including he learning about the uh, clap surgery, orthognatic surgery, and by some uh, interested to learn some of microtia surgery as well. The most of us special is that he will share how could apply and how she or he and learn some of the very special experience with some of our mentor in our institute. Of course, uh, Kisho, before he came to our institute, he already was a very experienced hand in his country as well. So we think we, we have the very uh, um, memorable time with him and we learned a lot from him as well. Today, we are so happy to have the Professor Yao with us because the most of the time, Kisho spent the lots of the time to learn with Dr. Yao to learn how to simulate the old orthodontic surgery and to make it to practical in the surgery and have very good outcome. And today we have some panelists with us from the Philippines, Dr. Ivy, and from Indonesia, Dr. Aoki. They both at the same time to have the time to be a fellow with Dr. Kisho as well. So I think I don't want to talk too much to waste my time. And I want to give more time for the Kishou to share uh, his experience. So today, the topic from Kishou is the Chang'em Cranial Facial Fellowship Applying Learning into Practice. So Dr. Kishou, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Cho. Uh, is my slide visible? Yes, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really very good to see you all today. A very good evening to everyone presented today. It indeed is a matter of pride to be presenting in front of my teachers, my mentors, my colleagues in Taiwan, and my friends all around the world. I am Kishore Bandari, and I am oral and magnificent sarsen working in Kathmandu, Nepal. As, as you all might know that Nepal is a small landlocked country situated between India and China. We feel proud to be called as citizens of the country which has the Mount Everest, the highest peak in the world, and Lumini, that is the birthplace of Buddha, the founder of Buddhism. We have 10 UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Nepal, and Nepal has been a major destination for tourists who love to see natural beauty. Now, talking about uh, my professional journey in very short, I did my undergraduate in dental surgery from Universal College of Dental Surgery in Nepal itself. And after working in government for two years, then I got selected to study master's degree in oral and maxillofacial surgery in China. I was attached to Chamus University and during my residency, I got a very beautiful opportunity to visit Peking University for one year. And in 2017, I got a chance to visit uh, UK Hamburg as an AOCMA fellow in cranial maxillofacial surgery. And following that, I, I visited Ames in India as a clinical trainee in TMJ surgery for one month. And following this, uh, it was a great 
pleased to be selected for fellowship in craniofacial surgery in Chunkung Memorial Hospital, Taiwan, through the sponsorship of Road of Craniofacial Foundation. Now, this is the workplace I work uh, presently in Kathmandu. This is the National Academy of Medical Sciences, Bir Hospital. This happens to be the oldest hospital in the country that was established in 1889. This hospital has 700 beds, and recently we have been allotted 10 beds ward for maxillofacial surgery. We intake one maxillofacial PG resident per year. Now, this is my team of maxillofacial surgeons and my residents who have always been a constant strong support for me and a strong positive drive force to take me forward. Now, this is Dr. Manish Pajacharya. He's really familiar to uh, the Chankang family. He is my orthodontist colleague in my hospital and a co-fellow at Chankang Memorial Hospital. I must mention that he is one of the main reasons we have been able to be established as a main hub for digitally planned orthodontic surgery, especially surgery first approach in the country in a very short time. Now, coming back to my presentation today, I'll be talking a brief about my fellowship in Chankang. After that, I'll be talking few things about the challenges that I had to face when I came back to my country after the fellowship. And then I'll be talking about orthodontic surgery, facial trauma, and a short about pediatric and facial surgery. And especially, I'll be trying to talk what I learned in Chankang and how I tried to apply those learning back in my country. So to start my fellowship review, I started my fellowship with this wonderful lady, Dr. Tengshan Lu, to learn about pediatric craniofacial surgery. During my stay of around five months with her, I really learned a lot about the basics of clips to advance a clip. Since I had very less exposure to clip surgery before, my stay with her really proved a very important step to learn the overall view of craniofacial surgery. Then I learned both uh, the treatment and principles of syndromic and non-syndromic craniofacial sources, cleft OGS, and I was lucky enough to be involved in few of her important researches as well. Next, I was with Dr. Chuang Feng Yao to learn about orthodontic surgery, my major area of concern during that time. I must say that staying with him happened to be one of the most important learning experience in my uh, professional career. With him, I got to learn about basic to advanced principles of orthodontic surgery, very, very fine surgical techniques that had evolved in Chankang over the past 40 years. And uh, because of his training, especially in virtual planning from Houston under Professor James Shia, I got lucky to be learning the, uh, the basics and the main essence of virtual surgical planning during orthodontic surgery as well. And finally, I spent two and a half months learning about cranial maxillofacial trauma and reconstruction with Professor Han Sun Liao. With him, I could learn a lot about post-traumatic deformities correction, intraoperative navigation surgery, transconjunctival optic difficult decompression surgery, the beauty of trauma and OGS combined together, and finally, a modified pre mini preauricular approach to access coronal neck fractures. Now, I can see a lot of fellows and a lot of senior surgeons in this meeting today. I think everybody of us might have uh, been to other, abroad, to other countries to learn various surgical techniques. And I feel you know, like learning from a big center and learning from a, like, you know, like a, a big mentor is one thing, but to utilize those learnings, to use those techniques, to use those all knowledge back in our homeland is a different story. We have, we do have our personal issues in our workplace, our you know, various factors really, really you know, like makes it difficult for us to use all those learnings back in our country. And even I and Nepal was not an exception to it. 
Now, to start with the first challenge was COVID situation. You know, like when we were in Taiwan, yes, uh, COVID had already struck all over the world. But you know, like we are really lucky that Taiwan had such a good control over COVID that we never had to feel we were struck by COVID. None of the surgery got canceled because of COVID. And we had a wonderful learning exp experience during that time. But when I came back to Nepal, it was a different scene here. The COVID was at its peak. All the elective surgeries were canceled and we are operating only the emergency surgeries. I had to wait almost six months to operate on the first orthognathic surgery or the first craniofacial surgery after I came back from Taiwan. Number two, I did have a good uh, know, like, uh, learning experience in virtual surgical planning and computer assisted surgical simulation. But the irony was in our country, we did not have any digital lab, no planning software, and no 3D printing services. But I must mention these two guys, Dr. Ujul and Dr. Manish, who listened to me, who trusted me, and who went to establish a 3D printing digital lab in Kathmandu for the first time. And because of them, it became possible for me to use all those learnings in Kathmandu as well. Number three, you know, like our hospital is a like it is a tertiary referral center. We get a lot of patients from all over the country but we have only two operating days per week. And in these two days, we have to operate on trauma, oral pathology, TMJ disorders, and et cetera, and many things. So to get a lot of uh, operating days for craniofacial surgery was also a big challenge. But thanks to my you know, like generous co-workers who agreed to provide at least one day per month to operate on orthopedic surgeries or any other craniofacial surgeries. When I came back, uh, we had almost, almost 22 patients waiting for orthopedic surgery. So that meant we had to wait at least two years to complete those patients. But we have good news now. We have a new surgical block being constructed and they have promised that they will be providing four operating days per week for maxillofacial surgery. And we are really excited that we'll be able to cut down the waiting time for our patients to very, very short duration. And coming to number four, you know, being a public institution, the operating cost for the patients is very, very low, almost $25 for a major surgery like orthopedic surgery or any surgery. So because of this, there's sometimes a lack of motivation in the hospital staffs or maybe even in the surgical team. But this was not a concern for us. The financial was not a primary concern. We wanted to establish this speciality. So we had to or like convince the authorities to push them to invest more in craniofacial surgery. Similarly, we had limited instruments and equipments to perform our surgeries, but, we, but me and my team, we never stopped convincing the hospital leaders to invest more and more in buying instruments for us. And luckily they have agreed to provide a major investment this year. And we're really looking forward to that also. Now, last but not the least, the lack of public awareness about craniofacial surgery, about craniosynostosis, about you know, like any other facets of craniofacial surgery was a major setback for us to give our services. So me and Dr. Manis, we thought that during the COVID time, we had less patients, so we were quite free. So we thought that we had to make some awareness videos. You know, like even Dr. Yao used to tell me, that if you want to get to more patients, you have to use social media. You have to go to like interviews. And I think that really worked for us as well. We made a few videos on our own. We posted on our social media platforms. We went to several TVs and radios platforms to give interviews. And we even wrote a lot of articles in newspapers and it really worked a lot. We had a lot of patients coming from referrals in government service and as well as private practice. Now, now I would like to start with the first part of my talk that is orthopedic surgery. So I will be talking, as I told earlier, what I learned in Chankan and how I tried to apply. In the first, I would like to talk a bit about the basic protocol that we follow whenever a patient of facial deformity comes to us. 
Firstly, the patient visits either the surgeon or the orthodontist based upon the source of referral. But whoever the patient visit, we schedule a combined meeting with a surgeon and the orthodontist, Dr. Manis in this case. And then in the combined meeting, we ask for an orthopantomogram, lateral cephalogram, and PA skull view. We perform a combined clinical examination. After that, we explain the treatment process, the complications involved, the time and the cost factor as well. Now, after the patient is convinced, we schedule a final meeting with the parents or the guardians and again repeat the same information to them. And if the parents are convinced, we hand over an information leaflet and get the content from signed. We have prepared one informational leaflet. You know, like this is a leaflet that has been prepared in local Nepali language. It contains all the information about the surgeries, about the complications, about the techniques, about the medical questionnaire and the consent as well. And the source of this question, uh, document was from Germany. And uh, when I was in Germany, I saw this uh, doc document, I was really impressed, but it was in German language. So I had to like translate to English first and then to Nepali. And now it has really helped us a lot to explain things to the patients better. Now, after that, after giving, giving the leaflet and getting the consent signed, we schedule an appointment for facial and intraoral photographs. I'm really lucky to have Dr. Manis, who is a really a very, very good photographer. And he even gives lectures on intraoral photography for dentists. So he takes uh, wonderful pictures of the patient and maintains a good record of various treatment stages. After that, we obtain dental records like impression, intraoclusal record, and then scan the casts. And it's the time for a comprehensive clinical examination now. Just before, maybe just one week before the surgery, we do a comprehensive clinical examination. And this is a from form I got from Dr. Yao. And I have been trying to make the most out of this form. And it has really helped me a lot make the right decision for the patient. And now we perform a non-contrast CT scan of the face. We do have CBCT in our hospital, but uh, the coverage is not enough to plan for orthodontic surgery. So it's like a only uh, uh, single jaw CBCD. So we have to perform this medical CT scan in the patients. And during the CT scan, we try to follow a certain protocol. For example, we try to scan with a bite index and we, uh, we provide some information to the technician like field of view, positioning and stabilization of the head and the slice thickness, et cetera, so that we get what we need for our virtual planning. Now, our orthodontist performs a digital safe analysis, and then we try to compare the digital safe findings with our clinical findings and try to sit together so that our clinical evaluation matches with the numbers. And we try to make a com common understanding about the planning and the uh, process. Now, the next digital planning workflow is quite uh, common to you know, like all the software and all the system systems maybe. Firstly, we try to arrange the head orientation uh, by following the natural head position. Uh, Dr. Manis, he takes the facial photographs in natural head position and during the planning, during the virtual planning, we try to align the skull in the same orientation so that you know, like we are planning in the right position for the patient. And after that, we merge the occlusal scan to the CT scan and create a composite skull model. After that, we simulate the osteotomies. Then we measure the magnitude of deformity. For example, the midline shift, the canting, the yaw discrepancies, everything. And we even try to correlate with our clinical findings. After that, we merge the final surgical occlusion and then we perform the linear movements of the maxillary mandibular complex, like the midline correction, incisal through adjustment, as per well the clinical examination record. Now, this is followed by some rotational movements of the maxillary mandibular complex with center of rotation at center of upper incisors, so as to obtain a harmonic pitch 
yaw, and roll measurements. After that, the intermediate and final wafers are designed and the STL file is sent to the digital lab for 3D printing. Now, I can proudly say that we have had a paradigm shift from the manual surgical planning like Facebook transfer, model surgeries, acrylic templates, paper surgeries to a complete digitally planned automatic surgeries at this point of time. And Chang Kung and the whole team owes the main credit for this. Now, let me talk about a few surgical maneuvers that I have tried to adapt from Chang Kung and that have really helped give the best to our patients here in Nepal. So first, I would like to mention a few basic learnings during the patient preparation. Let's start with the use of ray tube over flexo metallic tube. If we compare the right and the left uh, like picture, we can see that the flexo metallic tube really upturns the nose and lips in the patient, and it really makes it difficult to make a clinical judgment intraoperatively. But as you see on the left, the use of ray tube makes the nose very passive and the clinical judgment becomes very easier. Similarly, the use of decaderm over the paper tape for eye protection is also a very smart idea. We can clearly see the markings for intraoperative measurements with the use of decaderm. And another impressive thing I have learned is how the endotracheal tube used to be fixed to nasal septum and to the scalp with one zero six sutures. And we have stopped the using of nasal taping, which really used to obscure our view during the surgery. Even the use of toothbrush, you know, like it seems very simple, but it has made our job quite easier. Before, we used to use the gauze piece to clean the mouth. And you can imagine how you know, frustrating would it be with all those brackets and wire in the mouth to clean with the gauze piece. Number five, you know, the bleeding reduction protocols such as preoperative blocks and infiltrations, strict waiting time for LA to act, the bed and patient positioning, and intraoperative medications like chronic exempt acid has helped us reduce the blood loss, blood loss to minimum in our experience. And again, the dental tissue handling to minimize the facial swelling and the use of mini back drains in the BHS wound has really, really reduced the patient's swelling. And when we compare to our previous patients, we, we really feel good that the protocol used has helped us a lot. Now, I would like to go through some basic steps where you know, like we have tried to incorporate the learnings from Chang Kung in our setting right now. So this is how the surgical site used to be exposed uh, during the incision. We can see the uh, uh, tongue depressor, the mouth retractor in place with two uh, army navy retractors on the left on the right side, and the use of nerve hooks to locate the lingula is also a smart idea that I like often follow. Again, the use of pencils to mark our ostomy cuts makes our job really easier. The use of three millimeter carbide burst for the lingual cut to expose the marrow so that we can plan our further cuts very, very easily has also made our life quite easier here. I tried a lot to find these medial retractors in Nepal and in, even in India, but I couldn't find those medial retractors. So I had to like, you know, refrain to use of uh, channel retractors and it does, it does using, using, uh, working fine as well. Now, after the lingual cut with the burr, like, uh, I have been cutting, doing the horizontal cut with the saw, but the saw that we have here is quite thin. It is a micro saw. And sometimes it's very difficult to control the depth of the cut. And I have landed in some, you know, like complications as well, especially in such cases where we have an impacted third molar in position because of the thin blade, you know, it deflects away from the path of cut and it makes the buccal uh, cortex very, very thin. But, you know, like we have been trying to do the best with whatever we have in our hand right now. Now, the, another thing I would like to mention here is the use of Hansa technique and the use of the lingual cortex of the proximal segment 
as a source of bone graft. It has really, you know, like really, really helped us in many cases because we have to, we can avoid the use of extra oral sites like iliac crest in many cases. Now, coming to this point here, before I went to Taiwan, like uh, based on our few experiences, we used to extract the third molars, the impacted third molars six months before surgeries. But I saw like several cases in Taiwan that the extraction used to be done in the same day of surgery and it, it used to work fine without any complications. So following that, these days, we extract the impacted teeth on the same day of surgeries here. Now, yes, this is one more thing that I was really, really impressed with. The way uh, we used to fix the BSSO cut in Changkang. I have used this technique in a couple of our patients and it has really turned very, very useful. The two whole two play techniques uh, that we call at Changkang. Now, another thing that I was really impressed was the use of, I would say a smart use of wires. You know, like you can see here in the genioplasty uh, osteotomies, the use of wire has avoided the use of plates. And sometimes uh, like, you know, like we have, uh, we have issued that it has cut down the cost to the patient as well. And the patient becomes glad that they have avoided the cost for this. And the use of wires to hold the bone graph in place has also proved very, very efficient at certain times for me. Now coming to my axilla, now, the use of fingers to make the incisions have really given a good control over our like cuts. And again, the use of pencils to mark the osteotomy cuts for lifoid is also a very, very useful idea. Now, one more thing that I must mention is the way our uh, team at Changkang uses oscillating saw to cut to the pterygium maxillary junction. You know, I must tell that uh, I have not read in any textbooks, or I have not even heard in any other centers using this saw to cut through the junction. And I have felt that the use of this technique has really, really made the disjunction smooth and very, very less complicated. Yeah, though the uh, saw is very thin here, I think um, I have some, sometimes I really have a hard time because the blade bends very easily but I have been trying to use it to its maximum, you know, like effectiveness. Now, again, uh, the way, you know, like I used to, uh, uh, I, I used to see Dr. Yao injecting the nasal floor before the leaf foot, and it has really helped to reduce the bleeding and even to separate the plane from the nasal floor. It looks a simple technique, but it really helps during the surgery. Now, this is the final picture uh, where we have used intermediate splint on the left and a final on the right. And the way uh, we uh, wired the splints is also very, very typical in Changkang. And I have been trying to imitate uh, like how Dr. Yao did, but I, there's still a long way to go and uh, to, you know, to use these techniques back in my country. Now, uh, what I want to show in this photo here is the swelling, you know, like after leaf foot one, the BSSRO and genoplasty, and the swelling is on the table. and I must say that, you know, as compared to my previous patients, after I followed the Chang'e technique, we have been getting very, very impressive post-operative swelling, and the patients are very, very happy because the, what they would expect was far more swelling than this that I, we are getting right now. Now, I would like to present a few representative cases that we have operated in Nepal after I came back from fellowship, and the first case would be a surgery first approach using a bracketless surgery. That is, you know, the patient, uh, he's told that he wants to be a model and he wants to avoid braces. Dr. Manis was like, you know, I must say he was brave enough to plan a bracketless surgery for his first surgery first approach case in Nepal. So this was a young guy, 19 years old, who wanted to be a model, but he was not very happy with his face. And this was his intraoral view, the occlusion. You can see it was a skeletal class three mal occlusion. And after all those uh, protocols that I discussed previously, we made a final MMC uh, for him. And then since there was no brackets, we had to use screws to, uh, to get intraoperative maxillomandibular fixation and hold the splint in place. 
and this was uh, this uh, is the photo of aligners that the patient is wearing right now and when i see the uh, one year post op uh, in the frontal view uh, i think um, this is quite uh, okay result and patient is very happy with what he has got this is the profile view that we have got and the lateral smiling view and this is uh, how his initial occlusion looked like and right now on the right we have an occlusion in progress after he's, he got his 20th aligner and the uh, orthodontics is still in progress with him. And the good part here is he happened to be a professional model now. So he is very, very happy that he came to us, our team and underwent the surgery. And we even feel like now very, very good that he's happy with his life right now. Now, the second case that I would like to share here is a Cruzon syndrome in which we use the conventional orthodontic approach. This was a young lady uh, who came to us during her 17th uh, years of age. Uh, it looks like a mild cruzan syndrome, but she had not gone any surgery during her childhood. And uh, since it was a conventional approach, uh, she had her decompensation done. And about the planning, there were a few like options that we had in our hand. For example, we could go for a straight away a lifoid one, BCSO and dinoplasty, a high lifoid one, or even a lifoid two or three, and a lifoid one with a reef cartilage grafting for the infraorbital rims. We talked all the options to the patients, but you know, like uh, of course, lifoid two or three would be a very much to plan about her, but among the three options, uh, the parents were not very comfortable to go for a like second area of surgery. So we tried to go for number two, that is a high lifoid one, a BSSRO and dinoplasty. This was our uh, like marking of the high lifoid one cut with a step uh, like, you know, uh, downwards and the right photo shows uh, the cuts after the down fracture. And this is what uh, we saw the next day of surgery in the lateral cephalogram. And this was the photograph six months post-op and she was de already debonded after six months. This is the frontal view, the profile view, the smiling view, and a lateral smiling view. She has grown to be a very, very you know, confident lady now. And she's really very, very happy that she came to us for the uh, surgery as well. And that, this is how her occlusion looks like as compared to previous and the day of debonding. Now, the other third case that I would like to show here is a cleft OGS. And even in this case, uh, we went for a conventional approach because this case was there uh, from the last four years. She was waiting for a turn. And after we came back from Taiwan, we straight away plan for her. She is a nurse by profession. And like, you know, like she was looking a lot of options to correct her malocclusion and to correct her facial profile. This was how she looked on her profile view. And when we saw the intraoral you know, like, uh, examination, we saw that uh, she had a partial fistula, a big fistula still remaining, and her left upper central incisors were non-vital and mobile. So we plan to get rid of teeth and replace with some prosthesis here. And when we saw the CT scan, we saw that she had a very, very like, thin rim of alveolar bone, like as a result of uh, ABC that was done during 17 years of her age, I think. So I did discuss this case with Dr. Lu and Dr. Yao, and we had a lot of options, but you know, like we I tried to make it simple and just to go for surgery without grafting and without the fistula closure. So this was what we found uh, the next day of surgery. This is a PA skull view, and this is the lateral safe view. And this is the frontal uh, photo six months post-op after debonding the frontal view, the smiling view, as she has some, some of her teeth replaced, and she's really a like, happy patient now with happy doctors as well. The profile view and the uh, lateral smiling view. And this is the occlusion, uh, which was initial and the final. So you can still see a lateral fistula here. Uh, we don't have any recent plans of closing it, but we do have a plan of like uh, revising her nose with rhinoplasty, uh, probably next month. Now, uh, the last case in this segment would be 
a case in which we tried to go for a wafer layers orthodontic surgery first approach. This was a young guy uh, who, uh, who is from India and he had some relatives in Nepal. So he read in some newspapers uh, about our information and he came to us for the surgery. And uh, this is his profile view. And intraorally, intra you can see that it's a case of a skeletal cluster deformity with anterior open bite. And yes, as I told that we uh, tried to you not know, like, try to go for a waferless approach. We designed cutting guides, we designed positioning guides. Uh, this, is, this is how the positioning guide looks like. We did have a lot of you know a lot of pitfalls um, during the the fittings, but it was a big learning experience for us. Uh, with the this is a photo with cutting guide in place, and after that this is a photo with positioning guide in place. And after surgery, uh, we had some like a difficult time in during the fixation, but uh, it really taught us, a, taught us a lot of things to plan for a second case. So, so this is how the patient looks after four months post-operatively, and his uh, orthodontics is still going on. So we can compare the occlusion, the initial, and the one after four months of surgery. And this is one case, uh, I must say it's a difficult case, uh, the most difficult case we had faced till now to plan. You know, this young lady, uh, she had a surgery done for amyloblastoma when she was 12 years of age. And during the surgery, you know, like the, uh, there was injury to facial nerve and she had a left-sided facial palsy. And we can see the facial deformity during, uh, due to the non-existent mandibular reconstruction and the resultant deformity of the face. So we can see that in the panorex, that she has a uh, missing condyle ramus and the posterior body region. And in the 3D view, we can see a significant canting of her occlusal plane and a significant yaw relation of the mandible as well. So what we thought or what we planned was to go for a cant correction with the Lifford one, unilateral, so that it's split on the right side and then go for a fibula flap reconstruction on the left side. So we had this plan in mind, but we were really very, very worried if it would work or not. So we can see a, like a 3D simulation of the plan here. And we got like a 3D print of the final model. We pre-bend the plates here. And during the surgery, the use of cutting guides and the use of shaping guides really helped the plastic surgeons because we, it was a combined case with our plastic surgery colleagues. And then even the pre-bent plates helped us a lot to position our reconstruction very, very efficiently. And this was the uh, panorex after surgery with uh, Lefort one, with the bone grafting in the gap and the unilateral so that it was split and the fibula flap reconstruction on the left side. Like if we could get this result, I must say, it's not, it might not have been the best result. And because of the facial palsy, there was a lot of masking of the deformities. And uh, he had a lot of issues with her wound healing as well because of the contractor and his scar from the last uh, surgeries during her childhood. But we tried to give our best with what we had in our hands for the patient. Now, after the discussion about the orthodontic surgery, I would like to talk a few things about facial trauma and reconstruction that I learned from Professor Hans Chung Liao in uh, Lingo Chankang. So first thing I would like to mention here is, is the use of mini pre-auricular approach to mandibular condylar neck fractures. When you see the patient here, you can see the condyle is fractured at the neck. Normally, many surgeons, including us, used to use either retromandibular approach or a pre-auricular approach to fix this fracture. But the major disadvantage of this approach is that they both provide an indirect access. And sometimes it's very difficult to plate uh, or difficult to fix with the indirect access from these approaches. So there is a publication from uh, the Trauma Chankung team uh, in which uh, they have designed a mini pre auricular approach and they use a uh, serial coronal CT scan cuts and take the inferior border of the yellow margin to mark the area of fracture in the patient's skin. So here we can see on the left side, we have marked the fracture line 
based upon the coronal CT scans. And the incision extends one centimeter above and one centimeter below the fracture line. And it, it gives a direct access to the fracture. And I have felt that it has made our you know, life very easier in like, certain difficult cases. So you can see uh, the panorex here with, uh, with satisfactory fixation, with good mouth opening. And if you see the scar, I think uh, it's not too bad scar in front of the ear. Now, similar case, number two, again, uh, conalar neck fracture, the same incision. And this was an almost one and a half month old case. So it was really difficult for us to get hold of the conalar neck here, conalar segment here. But you know, like the excess was directly on the fracture, so we could do our job quite easily. And this was how the uh, post-op anorex looked like after the surgery. Now, the second uh, thing that I had learned in Chang'an trauma posting was the harvesting of a cal calvarial graft for nasal basal reconstruction. Now, this young guy here, he had a, a like commented fracture of the mid face. We can see his nasal bridge is completely flat and he has a traumatic telecanthus as well. So uh, since we had to uh, like take a coronal approach to address the fractures, we used the approach to harvest a calvarial graft and then, uh, then graft it in the nasal bridge. And you can see in the surgery that we had a significant improvement of his nasal bridge uh, prominence and it really worked fine for him. So this is the pre-operative view and post-operative view after five months and I think uh, uh, maybe I could have made uh, the breeze more prominent, but uh, yes, I think the patient is quite glad about this result also. Now, the part three of my presentation here would be to talk a few things about cranial synostosis. You know, like one thing uh, I would like to mention here is that, uh, yes, I really had a great time learning about the surgical techniques and the patient evaluation for syndromic and non-syndromic cranial synostosis. But the difficult part that we have faced here is to convince the parents and to convince the guardians to go for surgeries. Yes, it is a bit easier to convince the syndromic cases, but for non-syndromic kinesinosis, I really have had a difficult time in few patients to gain the trust of the parents to go for a major surgery. I think it would need more time and more experience, or maybe more awareness to attract more parent, patients and parents to be ready to go for the surgery. We have one case here. It was a case of secondary pan-sutural sources. The patient uh, reported to uh, the neurosurgery department and we had a combined meeting and we decided to go for a posterior cranial valve distraction in the first stage and frontal orbital advancement in the second stage. But you know, like our, uh, I may say our unlock that you know this uh, distractor that we used to use in Chang'an was KLS Martin distractors, and they were not available in Nepal. When I tried to inquire in India, they were very very expensive, and the patient could not afford to buy the distractors. And uh, the insurance system in Nepal is not very robust to uh, like uh, to pay for these uh, expensive devices, but. We had one uh, backup plan in mind. You know, this is a mandibular ramus distractor. It is made of stainless steel. Since this distractor are for temporary uses, we plan to use these distractors to use for posterior cranial valve distraction. So we had a 3D printing services already. So we had this printing in our hand uh, so that it would be easier for us to plan our cuts better during the surgery. So uh, this was how we tried to use these distractors in the patient and the 3D plan model made our job easier to demark the area of osteotomy. And the protocol that we used for the distraction was a latency period of 72 hours followed by one millimeter per day of distraction in two sessions. That means 0.5 millimeter in each 12 hours. Then we plan to go for a consolidation period of three to four months, followed by distractor removal and frontal orbital surgery during the same time if indicated. So uh, I'm sorry for the bad, uh, bad quality of photograph, uh, radiographs here, but we can see a considerable 
gap between the distractor arms and we could get a like appreciable change in his posterior vault contour at the end of distraction. So this is the final photographs uh, and we could distract 15 millimeters on the right side and 20 millimeters on the left. And we're quite happy with the result with our first case ever in the country. Now there was a second case. It was, uh, it is a uh, Kujan syndrome. And this patient has, you know, like uh, open fontanel, open anterior fontanel with the brain tissue protruding out of, from there. So patients were from a far remote village. They came to the hospital and on the, like, you know, like uh, 3D scans, we could see the defect in their anterior cranial vault. And we plan to go for frontal orbital advancement surgery for this patient in the first stage. And we had all the plannings done. But unfortunately, the patient has some medical issues uh, due to which we had to postpone the surgery. We were still waiting for the surgery to happen. And um, I guess uh, this, again, this would be a big, you know, like a leap in critical surgery in the country uh, because uh, previously the field of craniofacial and the field of craniofacial resources in Nepal was very, very primitive form. And we are trying our best to bring this learning from Changkung to Nepal and we are really waiting for like you no know, good number of patients in coming days. And I think this um, marks the end of my case presentations here. So I have talked a brief uh, about automatic surgery experience, a brief about trauma experience, and a brief about craniosynostosis experience here. So uh, towards the end of my presentation, I would really like to thank from the bottom of my heart the whole so craniofacial surgery team at Changkung. Uh, Professor Eurasian, Professor Lau, Professor Chang, Professor everybody you know, who directly or indirectly helped me and my fellow colleagues to learn from the best center in the world and to provide the best to our patients back in our country. And yes, how could I forget these wonderful people, my like dear friends for life, you know, like who made my stay in Changkang a really, really fun feel, memorable one, along with, you know, like, learning and like a lot of lot of uh, skill achievements yes i must mention node of clinical foundation beneficial foundation here without whom this fellowship would not have been possible so my heart goes out to the whole ncf team here in taiwan and yes as i already mentioned that if these two wonderful doctors dr ujol and dr monis if they have not established this I align the 3D printing and digital lab in Kathmandu, all the cases that I showed here today would not have been possible to present. My thanks goes out to them as well. So towards the end, uh, coming to this point of time, I have felt that, you know, like if, if, you, if we want to learn something in life, if we want to uh, like gain some skills or some advanced training in life, learning is never ending. No, you can learn whichever the path you go. Either you go straight, you go left or right. But if you have the passion of learning, the learning goes on. And the key to deliver is to never stop learning. That, was, that is what I have you know, learned from Changkang. And I have, I have been trying to implement in my country to the best of my capacity. So, like you no, know, like in future, uh, me and my team are really working to establish a comprehensive clinical center in Nepal. Because right now we are not uh, we are not providing care services, because uh, in Kathmandu there are already already three or four good centers that are providing the care facilities. So we're trying to focus more upon the clinical resources and alternative aspect of clinical surgery. We even would like to start a fellowship or a short-term training in OGS especially surgery first approach, like uh, with the help of Dr. Manis. So we are looking forward to this as well. And yes, we are looking forward to establish an in-house 3D printing and digital lab in our hospital with the facility of navigation surgery. We have been talking to our authorities about this and they are quite positive and we look forward to a good clinical center in our hospital in coming days. So, you know, like, uh, I have a you know, like based upon my experience in Changkang, I have a few suggestions to my colleagues or my juniors who want to pursue for the training in beneficial surgery. The first requirement would be a deep interest. 
I would say that just don't go for a fellowship because you get it. Just go for a fellowship in which you have a deep interest and a basic knowledge and skill before you go for a training will be very, very useful. Number two, you know, if you, ha you have a skill in hand, but if you don't have a platform or if you don't have a patient flow, that training is of no use. So I would like to say that you need to have a stable platform to work after you come back from the training so that you, know, you don't forget because if you come back from the training and you, you have no patience for one or two years, the skill will you know, blunt out slowly and slowly. The next thing is a support or the team help because I have seen that without a teamwork, nothing is possible in craniofacial surgery. For example, if you are very, very trained in craniofacial like uh, orthognathic surgery, but if you don't have a trained orthodontics, things are not going to work out. So it's better to plan a good team of surgeons, orthodontists, and all the auxiliaries in hand if you want to deliver the best. And finally, you know, I, I have felt that Artificial surgery has to be a long-term goal because I know that Changkung is dear now because of the hard work of the leaders from 40 years. It's not a matter of a one night or one year, one year or 10 years. The hard work has paid off now and it has stood as one of the biggest artificial centers in the whole world. And I feel really proud to be a part of that. And, you know, like, uh, I, I was lucky to uh, publish a paper about a one year craniofacial surgery fellowship at Changkang Memorial Hospital in a uh, craniofacial surgery journal. And I am getting a lot of inquiries from many, you know, like friends and colleagues around the world about the fellowship. And I have been trying to help them to reach out to the center in a more efficient way. So, as a concluding remarks, I would say that the Changkang Craniofacial Surgery Fellowship has proven tremendously helpful in laying the foundation of craniofacial surgery in Nepal. It is still a long way to go, but the foundation laid will be forever treasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think this marks the end of my presentation here. Over to you, Dr. Cho. Thank you very much, Kishore. Uh, I think you have a really good presentation and I think it's really nice to hear from you again. And I want to congratulate you on being able to accomplish so much in Nepal. And also um, some of the cases that you shared were truly amazing. So I want to congratulate you on that. Now, uh, first of all, I would like to invite Professor Lowe for a few comments. Professor? Uh, yes, Dr. Kisha, uh, very nice to see you again. And- uh... Thank you, Professor. It's really great to see you here. Yeah, really? and thank you for your presentation. I was quite uh, amazed that you can achieve a lot of, uh, uh, you know, difficult surgery uh, in your in your in your hospital under the setting uh, from the beginning and then step by step and until today and uh, really uh, amazing result. I must congratulate you. Uh, you have done a uh, very, uh, you know, spend a lot of time and hard works to achieve this. And I also noticed that your presentation PowerPoint is very nice. Your, your photo are clean, not bloody. Uh, this is, uh, you know, only a careful surgeon can pay this uh, attention to, you know, how to make a good presentation, beautiful slides uh, without bloody uh, surgical wounds. And that's really nice. And I also uh, saw that you do uh, with, uh, a bracketless OGS, waferless OGS, and apply the 3D simulation, 3D printing uh, is, is good. I do want uh, to mention that uh, uh, we, we should have a team and you, you, you also should have a good team. And <clears throat> because uh, uh, you are a maxillofacial surgeon, so easy to get uh, uh, orthodontic support. And I wish that you also have a nice uh, long-term cooperative 
uh, general anesthesiologist. I think this is very important that, you know, in, in Chang'an, uh, we do have a very long-term relationship with good, uh, where is experienced uh, uh, anesthesiologist. And this is very, uh, very important part. And I hope that you also have, uh, you know, a very nice friend who is also uh, an anesthesiologist that you can cooperate, that provide a safe uh, background, you know, for you to concentrate the surgery without worry about uh, blood pressure, breathing, aftercare, and this is important. And also, uh, I saw you are doing this uh, intracranial procedure. So you must also have a, a good uh, neurosurgeon that could cooperate with you together to do the surgery. It's very nice. And I, I just, as I have one point that I would like to mention that you, uh, your planning is that someday you would like to have an in-house 3D printing. I would, uh, I would, I would suggest that you put this uh, in the last step uh, in your uh, developing your your career because uh, 3D printing uh, in Chang'an we do have in-house uh, printers, 3D printer, but that. That's quite expensive and uh, uh, to maintain also spend uh, a lot of money. So uh, in at, at this moment, maybe you can easily have so-called outsourcing, you know, a company that you could easily uh, get uh, the 3D printing uh, for your orthognosis surgery, uh, for your like cutting guy, uh, you know, positioning guy, uh, this kind of thing just give your idea and then and then talk to the company and then if you increase your practice and you 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 there's a company that can uh, work together or you have a good budget from your hospital or from whatever kind uh, company uh, then you can prepare uh, so-called in-house 3d printing so these are my comment but really i'd like to congratulate you on your success really enjoy listening to your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much, Professor Lo. It's really good to hear such nice comments from you and it really uh, gives me more and more of motivation to work better. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, and next, we would like to invite a key source mentor in traumatic craniofacial surgery, Professor Liao Hantong. Professor Liao? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Hello, Professor. It's really good. great to hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I, I Actually, I have no comment. I just want to congratulate uh, your achievement, <laughs> especially under the limited source from the Nepal. Yeah, you, you can uh, do what you learn in Chang'an and uh, uh, can do everything in your country, but uh, your support is limited. I know you you are searching uh searching the support for the buying the software from the brand lab to do the navigation like uh, we do here. I I hope you can <laughs> get the support and uh, yeah. to search to service your patient uh, more precisely. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Liao. You know, like your your teaching has helped me a lot, you know because I had a few experience in trauma, but after looking at you, I have really known my pitfalls and I, I'm really feeling confident these days to open condals and to do orbital for reconstruction and everything. Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah, I, I think you you are the most smart uh, fellow <laughs> that I, I have ever met <laughs> because you, you, can, you can learn from me and uh, copy that and uh, do in your country. Yeah, I, I, thank you very much. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, next, we would like to go to our panelists. First of all, we would like to invite Dr. Yao. Dr. Yao. Hi. Hello. Kishore. Hello, Dr. Yao. Yeah. Nice to see you after a long time. <laughs> uh, I think, um, of course, I, I, I congratulate on your success, but but this is I I don't feel 
you know, I, I, I don't feel it's very unexpected. I already expect that you have this type of success after you return. <laughs> so uh, I have, but uh, I have only a bit question about the, could you, uh, could you share with me? Because I never do the so-called uh, way for this. <laughs> <laughs> also necessary. Would you would you like to comment on? Do you find any difficulty, or would would you find a proper indication? So this is something more practical, and uh, and then uh, I hope someday maybe we, uh, Doctor Lu and I can go visit uh, Nepal. <laughs> okay, <laughs> please. Actually, Doctor Yao, yeah, uh, yeah. Of course, uh, I did not see oophelia surgery in Changkang, but you know, like going through a few papers. Uh, because we had the support of 3D printing for external or outsourcing lab. So we thought, okay, let's give it a try. But yes, as you told, it was not easy because we had only two points of reference from the pyriform, no, like pyriform rims and the bone was not very stable. The, the lower segment was something like a wafer, but the main uh, reference was from the pyriform. So I had some hard time to control the posterior part of maxilla. But you know, like, because it was the first case, we also had the splint as a backup, but you know, like, uh, and we also knew that, we also knew the amount of advancement or intrusion or whatever from our simulation. So it made our job easier because if I didn't have those ideas in mind, I don't think it would have been possible just to depend upon the, uh, the guide only. Okay, thank you. So I think we can pass to the next. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and next we have a couple of uh, Kishore's good friends, and I'm pretty sure we'll have a lot to um, talk to him about. Um, first of all, I'd like to invite Alki and Dana, Dr. Alki and Dana. Yeah, hello, Kishore. It's been nice to see hello, you. Hello, Alki. How are you, bro? <laughs> hi, I'm good. Uh, I would like to say hi to uh, my my teacher also, uh, Professor, I see Professor Lo here, and Dr. Yao, uh, Dr. Lu, uh, Dr. Cho, and also Junior. Hi, Junior. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> okay, uh, I really like to uh, con congratulate you because uh, the achievement that you already uh, made, uh, I saw your uh, uh, operation after your surgery and, and also the result is very, very beautiful. And I want to uh, share about uh, my little experience in Indonesia because I think we have the similar uh, uh, country, right? Because we are a development country, we don't have uh, many support from uh, the other uh, company or the others. But you have beautiful beaches, we don't have beaches, Alki. <laughs> 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 So I, I, I'm really, really proud of become the, the last uh, fellow, uh, craniofacial fellow in Changgeng uh, after the pandemic, of course, because we, yeah. like five, five or us, right? We, we are the last uh, fellow, craniofacial fellow in, in, in Changgeng that graduate. Uh, so uh, I learned a lot, a lot about uh, orthodontic surgery and also the class technique in Changgeng. Uh, for the example, like, uh, uh, before I go into Changgang, uh, we uh, we do the orthodontic surgery uh, for the one jaw is like uh, uh, for the duration is like uh, six until eight hours for one jaw. But after uh, after I going to went to Changgang and I go back, I get more confident and we uh, did the double jaw surgery like seven hours. I, I know it is still too. Too long, but <laughs> I think it's it's uh, improvement for, for for me and for my uh, for my center. So uh, about and and number two is about the cost. Uh, we also don't, don't have uh, any uh, good cost uh, right here in Indonesia. But uh, our goal is to establish uh, our orthodontic uh, specialty also in Indonesia, especially in in Surabaya. Uh, I think. Uh, that's it. Oh, one, one more. I think it's, it's very smart uh, for you to uh, post your uh, advantage uh, in, in, in social media uh, during the, the COVID time because uh, 
I heard that uh, everyone in, in uh, among your country is uh, looking for you for uh, orthodontic surgery, right? Okay. And I also have a one question, Kishore. Uh, do, do you what what do you uh, the apps or the program that, that you use for the uh, digital training? <laughs> <laughs> and that's a very very big question but you know like yeah because these days uh, we're lucky that you know the i align is the team here it is uh, like a uh, outsourcing company and they have some tie ups with some chinese like companies and of course i'm glad to be using simplant here they have oh. the option of simplant and proplan both they even have uh, mimics and a lot of softwares but uh, because i i was trained uh, in Dolphin and Simplan from Dr. Yao and Professor Liao, I feel more confident because uh, Dolphin, they don't have, and uh, we cannot buy right now. So I'm depending upon them for Simplan, yeah. Okay. All right. I think that's it. Uh, thank you, Kishar. Congrats. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah. Okay, and um, for our last panelist, we have Dr. Ivy Tango. Ivy? Hi. Hi, good evening to everyone. Hi, Hi Dr. How are you? Hi, Ivy. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations for your presentation. It was really good. And um, as your co-fellow, I can really relate to the struggles that you had because uh, I've also come from a developing country. And also, I'm really... Um, it was it was really a good uh, presentation that you had because you had a lot of patience, and then uh, I just want to ask uh, how were you able to go through your problems with the finances of your patient? Because uh, of course, as we know, orthognathic surgery is really it's not it's not a cheap surgery, and uh, how were you able to manage the finances of your patients? How were you able to convince them? Because uh, that's also one of my struggles. For example, if I would uh, want to convince a patient for um, yes, orthodontic surgery, and then if I already mentioned how much it would cost, and then the patient will already back up, of course. So, so how were you able to convince these patients, of course, in the midst of the pandemic, that um, these patients would not really... Uh, go into these types of surgery as of this uh, pandemic, of course, because every, everybody has uh, financial problems. And then um, uh, one last question after that is that um, for the waferless surgery, I'm also interested in that because you mentioned it. Um, um, what type of patients do you consider uh, using the waferless surgery? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ivy, for your comments and your questions. Uh, coming to the first question here, I think yeah, I think I'm the right person to answer the question because how I convince the patients for surgery. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so the thing here is uh, because our surgical chart is very very less because you know I told you that it's only twenty five dollars for surgical charge. So what they have to pay for is the implant and for the planning and three D printing charge. Okay. So altogether. It comes out to be almost two to three thousand USD, and it's not cheap. Uh, like you know, like mm -hmm. I agree that it's not cheap. But you know, like when the patients listen to us, that we are the only team who are providing the digital planning service and the accuracy that we can offer them. Because there are two or three other centers in Nepal, they are doing like good surgeries. I must say, like they are our colleagues, they are doing good job. And but maybe because of the digital planning that we have, they are quite attractive. And because if we operate in private practice, the cost would go to really, really, you know, like high, almost six to 8,000 USD. So if we compare to the private, so it's really very cheap. So uh, because of the very, very less surgical charge, we are able to do the, these surgeries at our hospital. I think that's the main reason. And because uh, uh, they don't have to pay anything for the surgeons, for nurses or for anything else. So implants, and even I'm trying to use synthesis here because the first time I tried to use synthesis in Nepal, but it, because yes, it's expensive for some patients, yeah. we have yeah. options of cheap uh, Indian implants as well. But till now, like you no, know, like I have not used Indian implants for OGS, but we do use it for trauma cases. So if that problem comes, we still have a way to cut down the cost to more minimal. And even 
sometimes if the patient says that they don't want to go for a digital plan surgery. If they say that, okay, they are happy with a manual lip plan surgery, again, the cost comes out to be very, very less. So I think that's how you can cut down the cost for the patients. And about the second question, actually there is no uh, uh, special indication for wafer-less surgery. Of course, we need to have a 3D printing you know, like facility for that. Uh, uh, in uh, wafer-less surgery, we get the reference from the skeletal landmarks. In like, you know, like the other wafers, we get the reference from the mandibular occlusion. But for uh, wafer-less surgery, we get reference from the bony landmarks. So actually it's a similar type of uh, you know, like technique, but it, there's no such special indications for uh, such. Thank you. I, I hope I answered your questions. Yes, maybe maybe we, we could visit, visit Nepal, I think, to learn about yeah. the Nepal. <laughs> that would be great. That would be great. And then go hiking. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sure. Okay, so um, at this time, we would um, move on to the Q&A section. And first, we have a question from Patrick Chen, who was a um, cranial maxillofacial fellow in Adelaide. And he would like to ask Kishor approximately how many cases of OGS, uh, OGS cases were you involved at in Chang'an during that year? Actually, uh, in Chang'an, uh, because uh, if you go through my paper that I showed here, uh, I have given the full data. But as I remember, when I was with Dr. Yao, I think I was involved in 36 cases. In, in all of these cases, all these cases, uh, Dr. Yao let me, you know, like at least operate on one side. So I had a full hands-on experience. And if you talk about the cleft OGS with Dr. Lu, I think uh, there was like almost 18 cases of uh, cleft OGS. So altogether, I had experience of more than 50 cases during the fellowship for OGS only. Yeah. Okay. And for our uh, second question, I think it's another friend who is very familiar with Kishore. Chu Chin, and I would like to invite her to come and ask the question herself. Thanks, Thanks Junior. Um, hey, Kishore. Nice hey, to see you. Congratulations. Yeah, I must say you. that she's got married. Congratulations, Chu Chin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I uh, just got married. But yeah, th thanks a lot. I think um, it's a really impressive achievement that uh, you actually managed to get done, uh, you know, in, in the face of such limited resources and stuff. Uh, I guess just uh, from my question uh, is that, you know, how do you get around with hospital administrators and managers when you're trying to get them to give you money to buy your instruments and things? Because obviously they have, you know, multiple other departments they need to consider. So any tricks and tips you can give to the rest of us here? Oh, yeah, I think that's a very, very important question. And I, I think, again, I'm the right person to answer that because I have been going around these people from the last, you know, like two years. But, you know, like every time, you know, like the budget comes to the hospital, you know, we are not maxillofacial, we are not craniofacial, we are dental. The budget comes as dental. You know, and you see, you know the perspective that the administration has over dental, uh, like faculty. So, you know, when I tell that, okay, I need this amount of money to buy instrument, they say, why does a dental surgeon need so much money for an instrument? Uh, you know, things like that comes to us. But, you know, like, yes, I try to show them my cases. Every time there's like a PPT ready in my laptop, so wherever I go to meet the Anderson people, I just show them the cases and they get amazed seeing the you know, chains of surgery. And I even like share the, the media coverage with them because you know, of course, like, you know, the media has a very good coverage of our work, be it in a, like a major like a, a television or in a newspaper. So like they are covering it like the time and again. So, and sometimes they see our passion. Sometimes they see our feelings and they feel pity. And, and, and this year after this, it's hard work and they have decided to give a good amount of money you know like they are buying me good saw they are mining buying me piezo they are buying me tmj arthroscopy and they are even planning to buy me you know navigation so like i really looking forward to that so i just really hope they really don't change their plan now and you know and this thing goes the other way hmm. nice one thanks for sharing yeah thank you very much Sushin. okay thank you thank you shows and the thanks Ivy, Aoki, and the Pachins. Uh, today is what a reunion uh, with all our previous fellows. Uh, I'm so happy and uh, very lucky to have you have the time with us. 
Uh, I think based on the key shows the diligence and uh, his consistency, uh, just like uh, Professor Yao already had mentioned, we already can predict uh, the good performance he could achieve like the day he present with us. Yeah, sure. Probably in the future, he seriously could uh, establish one of the Korean official center in Nepal and have uh, his own uh, 3D printing printer uh, and he could train in another junior guys in the osmotic surgery as well. Thank you, Professor Lo. Thank you, Han Chong Liao, Professor. And thank you, Lu, and thank you, Yao. And thank you, Ivy, Aoki, and Puchin. I hope probably in the future time, you guys could present and share your domestic, your local experience like Kisho today with us, even in the Philippines, Singapore, or Indonesia as well, OK? <laughs> we can reunion every time, every time, sure. So thank you again, Kisho, and uh, thank you all the audience in this the webinar tonight, and uh, even in the morning or in the evening. And uh, see you, and uh, thank you for your participant. Thank you very much. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.